Good morning, folks. Um, so this morning, I'm just going to give a brief overview of some of the important aspects of the Mahabharat. Um, you know, it's problematic to try to summarize the Mahabharat entirely because it's um, the longest poem in the world. The video that I asked you to look at by way of introduction um, said that it's eight times the size of the Iliad and Odyssey combined. Uh, so rather than to try to um, go through the entire plot, <clears throat> if you, you know, I I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to hit some of the important points to help you understand what leads into the Battle of Kurukshetra and ultimately to the Bhagavad Gita. Um, and then in class, we'll be doing um, some work with the Bhagavad Gita. Um, and, you know, you also read, you also looked at the video um, introduction to the Bhagavad Gita. You have the text of the Bhagavad Gita in your folder for this week. Um, if you're watching on YouTube and uh, are not in the class, there are a plethora of translations available in English. You know, I highly recommend the Bhagavad Gita. Um, it, it is probably the most, has had the most profound effect on my life personally of, of any text. You know, Bhagavad Gita, Tao of Poo, you know, there's some other texts that, are, that really influenced me. Um, but anyway, um, so. This is a this text, the Mahabharat, continues to be influential and continues to um, fascinate folks. Um, you know, I shared with you the motion comic uh, series um, "18 Days" by Grant Morrison, who's famous for The Invisibles. Um, he did a run on Batman that's really well known and well respected. He did a um, run on um, Doom Patrol, right? Um, and so he's a, he's a very well respected um, comic book artist uh, and and writer, actually writer, not artist. But he also did a academic, more academic piece on the um, role of superheroes as postmodern myth, postmodern um, heroes and gods. Um, so, in any case, someone of the caliber of Grant Morrison in postmodern culture and postmodern uh, uh, thought, as far as culture is concerned, you know, uh, created a sort of futuristic science fantasy series based around the Mahabharat. Um, and sort of most telling, I mean, in Morrison's version, right, and he does take, he does take quite a bit of liberties, but Anyway, in, in Morrison's version, he refers to Kshatriyas, which if you recall from last week's class, as well as um, the previous video on the, on the Ramayan, I said that Kshatriya roughly means um, one who protects through harm, you know. So um, they are the paladins, if you will, the knights, um, the, the, the samurai, um, the, the, noble, the noble warrior, um, very principled folks. Right. And key to um, this in the Mahabharat, as we'll discuss briefly, is the notion that a Kshatriya cannot, should not refuse a challenge from someone um, with whom he is essentially equally matched. Right. So someone with um, who is armed, right? A Kshatriya is not supposed to attack an unarmed foe, et cetera, et cetera. But also in the field of gambling, which is also a kind of combat, if you will. Um, of course, there are um, stakes there, you know. Um, and, and that's really kind of getting ahead of myself, but, but that's what, uh, what figures in greatly into the Mahabharata. So, and if you, of course, this 
was mentioned in the video as well. They got some details incorrectly in the video, um, which which I'll get to perhaps, but it's not so much important. But so what is important really in understanding the the uh, basis of of this war that happens in the Mahabharata and is really the, the central uh, point, the the um, crescendo, if you will, is that. Um, there was a shift between um, those who were truly qualified um, in terms of inheritance, in terms of ability, and so forth, um, coming into power versus those who were simply handed power because they were the inheritors, right? They were the heirs, right? There was, there was a, a major shift that happens here, and it happens um, because of a, a dis some decisions made by King Shantanu and his, um, his son. So King Shantanu um, was the um, king of Hastinapur, which literally means the elephant city or the elephant kingdom. And um, this, at that time, just like in, in the Ramayan, the um, Ishvakus were essentially the rulers, rulers of the world. By the time you get to the Mahabharat, the, the, um, the, uh, the dynasty of, of the Kuruvas, the Kurus, were the rulers of the world. And um, the, the term Mahabharat means um, great, great Bharat or great earth, right? So the, the term Bharat or Bharata, refers simultaneously to the Indian subcontinent as well as to the entire earth, right? So earth is also referred to as a goddess, specifically Bhumi, um, but anyway. Um, so King Shantanu is king and he's doing his kingly stuff and he's he um, happens upon this um, fisher, fisher village um, and he sees this young woman, Satya Bhati, and she has this just incredible, this in, in, indescribable fragrance. Um, and he is completely um, smitten by her and wants to marry her. So, um, and there's a whole story by that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, uh, Parashra Muni, who is famous as the, the, the founder of astrology, right? Um, he, uh, in, in according to India, right? So he's wanting a trip across the lake, across this lake, and he, he sees Satya Pati, and he's, he's also smitten with her. Well, at this time, she doesn't have an, in, an in indescribably beautiful fragrance. She smells like fish. Uh, because she was born of the belly of a fish, because her father, who was in fact the king, her original father, had um, had ejaculated upon seeing, um, I believe it was uh, some Gandharvas or some some beautiful uh, 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 female celestial woman celestial or something like that. Anyway, he he had an emission, and um, that was then ingested. Uh, it was was carried uh, carried off, you know, on a leaf, and then ultimately ingested by a fish. In any case, um, she was born. Uh, Such a fatigue was born of a fish. Um, the way she was discovered by her foster father is he, of course, was gutting the fish. He opens up the fish, and there's a baby in there. And um, in any case, he she's raised as a, as a fisherman's daughter. Well. Parashar Muni being Parashar Muni, he, he sees that she is, in fact, not a fisherman's daughter. Originally, she, her dharma, her nature, is, is that of, of, of royalty, etc. And um, he wants to, um, to um, copulate with her, essentially. So she says, but, you know, I, I, I want to maintain my virginity. I'm unmarried. Etc. 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 He says no problem, you know, because he is a great yogi, a great mystic, so he can copulate with her and still preserve her virginity. He creates this 
sort of sort of missed and they make love and um, and her virginity is maintained and uh, and uh, she then has this incredible fragrance as a gift from Garash Ramuni. So also the and this figures out figures um, greatly uh, in the piece later on is that the child conceived thereof is um, becomes Veda Vyas, who is ultimately, again, according to legend, the author of not only the Mahabharat, but also the, he's the compiler of all the, all the Vedas, right, and also um, the Puranas as well. Um, so this incredible figure, he's considered also to be a partial expansion incarnation of Vishnu as well. But anyway, so he, he factors in later. So Shantanu meets Satyavati. He's incredibly, you know, smitten with her because of her fragrance. And, and she's also beautiful, right? Um, and what do we know about Kshatriyas? I mentioned briefly last time um, that the, the um, custom among Kshatriyas was to take multiple wives in part because they're just sheer virile you know they're 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 dynamic personalities they have in in as such they have incredible sex drives so um you know we can look to our modern times and we can look to certain um people in the public eye particularly in the political sphere and so forth and see that uh Fidelity, monogamy is, is 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 not necessarily their strong suit, right? Rama, of course, Rama was the exception, and we talked about that. Um, but uh, but in any case, Shatnu wants to marry Satyavati. Now, Satyavati's foster father he he may be a fisherman, but he is um, or rather a fisher king. Like he was kind of the head of the village. He was this fisherman, but he was he was kind of shrewd and kind of astute, you know. And he says, well, uh, you know, how do I, how do I guarantee that my daughter's sons will sit upon your throne? You have an older son who's in line for the throne. Now, pause there. The first son of Shantanu is someone who factors in very, very, um, prominently in the entirety of the Mahabharata. This is um, Deva Vrata, who will become known as Bhishma, and I'll explain that briefly. So Shatnu, his first love, um, he sees the personification, the goddess of the river Ganga, right? And of course, in, in or Ganges, Ganges River. And if you know anything even in passing about Sanatana Dharma, you know that the river Ganges is is or Ganga is is considered to be incredibly sacred because it um, washes over the feet of um, Lord 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 Vishnu and then down upon the hair of Lord Shiva and then comes down in the earth and so forth and so forth. So the idea is that one can become um, purified uh, uh, karmically speaking and so forth by way of bathing in the Ganga. And so, you know, the Ganga is very, very important um, still to this day. In fact, um, famously, um, over the um, pandemic, during the initial um, quarantine in India, uh, these sacred rivers that have been polluted for decades upon decades in the 20th, 19th and 20th centuries due to, you know, unchecked industrialization and so forth. The Ganga, the Yamuna, etc. These rivers in a matter of months were, were clean, you know. Um, so that, that actually says a lot, um, I would argue, about the way that we treat our planet and our planet's capacity to heal herself. Um, so, in any case, um, he sees the personified Ganga, the, the goddess Ganga. And of course, he, being Shantanu, falls in love with her. And he asks her to marry him. She says that she will under the condition that, she, that he 
not question any of her actions ever. Okay, so Shanu being a virile Kshatriya prince king, you know, he's like, whatever I got to do, I'm gonna do it. I'm, I, this is this is the this is the woman I I, I want to be with. I'm going to say what I have to say, and so on and so forth. So they get married, and of course, a ch ch a child comes. Well, she goes out. She um um. And upon the child's birth, she takes him down to the river and her again, her river, the Ganga, whom she is, okay, and she um, drowns the child. Shantanu is, is horrified by this, but again, he doesn't say anything because he had promised. Well, this occurs um, several more times uh, over the next um, few seasons, right? So finally, Shantanu has had enough. He just, he says, I, I just can't abide by this you know, anymore, how can this action be justified? You know, how can, how can emphasize be justified according to what's right, according to Dharma, the light side of the force, et cetera, et cetera, right? So he confronts her on this and she says, look, you don't listen. You have no idea what's going on here. Ye uh, little king, you know, king of this earth, right? King of this, tiny planet earth right uh these souls are, are very advanced souls and they needed to be born through my womb um to extinguish the last bit of their of their karma that was binding them to this material existence to this embodied existence and by drowning them i was you know releasing them to um their to eternal bliss essentially right so she says, in the, in the last child, you know, he saves from being drowned. And she says, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm gone. Uh, you know, you broke our contract, you, you know. And so she says, I'm going to take this child with me. And then I'm going to, you know, and I will return him later. So for many, many years, Shantanu doesn't hear, of any, hear from Ganga or his son, David Brata. You know, you'll see this. If you, if you study the Mahabharata in detail, you'll see this a number of times where a hero will have a, um, a child with a, either a celestial being or an empowered being and they're taken off and they're essentially given an education um, for that part of their heritage, according to that part of their heritage. And then they're returned to their, to their human um, uh, lands or their human reality. And of course, the one of the big differences um, that's spared out between um, sort of the human realm or the earthly realm and that of uh, extra human beings, if you will, is that time passes differently. Um, and so anyway, David Rata does return. Um, he's been trained by, you know, the most fan. He was actually trained by Parasuram, who was a, a uh, as I mentioned last time, as a as a um, avatar of Lord Vishnu, he 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 he's seen the heavenly planets. He's done all this cool stuff, and he's still a young man. Um, so you can imagine he is absolutely, you know, the most qualified person to become king of the earth. Um, and so, anyway, and he he and he meets his father, you know, as an adult, and he adores his father absolutely adores his father and they you know strike up this great relationship well of course enter Satyabhati and Satyabhati's father so Devavrata the son of Shantanu he all he really desires above everything else because of his familial loyalty and the dharma of a son is really to um to some degree carry out the particularly in this in this legendary context right is to carry out the uh wishes uh, of the family right to Kate and, and so he sees that Shantanu is dejected and upset and he says well, what's going on father you know what's going on he says I will do whatever is in my power to to help you you know and so Shatnu says, well, you know, I want to marry Satyavati. However, 
you know, her father says that his, his, you know, her sons should be the kings and so on and so forth. Um, but how can that be? Because you're in line for the throne. And then, so what happens is David Brata then takes this oath before the gods that he will, he renounces the, the throne first of all. And then he vows to never marry and to, to be celibate. And, and celibate and never marry, they're not exactly the same thing because um, heroes often do have children outside of, of, of wedlock. But he, he, he vows never to marry and, and, and to be celibate. So the gods are so impressed by this, so impressed with his loyalty to his father that and then they're also immediately horrified um, by the implications thereof right because Satyavati's sons although Satyavati is Satyavati and she's great and you know they are not going to be Bhishma they're not going to have the qualifications of Bhishma and so on and so forth and so the direction of the world then is changed right and the gods understand the devas the shining ones right they understand the implications here and they're hor horrified by this and so the vivrata takes on the names given the name bishma which means one of the terrible vow and he's granted um a boon right he's granted a gift by the gods that he will be able to choose exactly the manner of his death when and how he is going to die so this will factor in later on so the war that that you know is, is sort of the, the culmination of the Mahabharat is really the, 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 the it's set in motion here you know um I don't know, 150, 100 years prior, who knows how many years prior, but set in motion with this, this oath by Bhishma. Well, um, so Satyavati has two sons, um, Vichitravirya, and I can't remember the other one's name at the present. They're, they're, they're kind of minor characters because, well, they, they die off pretty quickly, right? Um, and the the wives that were chosen for those sons, right? Um, um, Ambi, uh, Amba and Ambika. You know, anyway, they also are, I mean, I'm probably screwing up their names, but again, they, they play an important role, but they play an important role in this, this regard. I mean, there are incredibly um, significant uh, women figures in the Mahabharata, for example, Draupadi, um, is is the probably the most significant also Queen Kunti, um, um, so and we'll get to Queen Kunti here in a second. But so um, basically, what happens is that the sons of Shanu are killed off, and uh, there is no one to carry on the divine lineage to carry on the dynasty so they don't know what they're going to do because Bish and Bishma will not break his vow and everybody kind of thinks Bishma's kind of a you know well, you know Bishma this is this is this is uh you know a really dire circumstance you know why don't you father a child on one of the one of um one of the widows and so forth um you know, uh, and uh, he says, no, he, he, as a Kshatriya and so forth, he cannot break his vow. Interestingly, in, in again, just to make a nerd reference here, in D&D, &D, like in the current version of D&D, &D, paladins, they get their power from oaths, right? So this the Bhishma cannot break his oath because he's in a, in a sense a paladin. and he has he's 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 uh moral right he's he's um 
he's noble, right? And he and he has these this code, right, that he cannot break. So, in any case, Satyavasi says, "Well, you know, I do have this other son," and she relates the whole story about Rashomuni and so on, and uh, she summons um, Veda Vyas. And he had been in intense meditation and he's all dirty and, you know, and so forth. Because again, um, he was of this, uh, of that class of folks that um, adhered to kind of the Upanishadic tradition, you know, going out in the forest and meditating and really seeking wisdom, um, you know, and uh but he's all there. He should, he appears with his mystic power, you know, that he he worked through as a yogi. And uh, she says, "Well, I need you to father children on on these uh, widows because that was permissible, just like in the um, biblical tradition. You know, when a when a man dies, his his brother was." able to, under the um, auspices of, of, of convention, uh, father children um, on his brother's wife, and they would be the brother's children, right? Um, but um, he says, well, okay, you know, why don't you let me come back? Because let me get cleaned up. Let me, you know, fix myself up because I look, you know, disgusting. Yeah. So it'd be kind of like, it'd be like if you know somebody went back you know back in the day in the in the 90s we had like the rainbow gathering you know where you go out in the woods for a week and uh, shower and, you know just do whatever and uh, you know that's that's a lot of fun but that's nasty you know so um, you know you come back with matted hair but same same principle I mean he, not 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 any sort of depravity or anything like that but he came back with you know he had matted hair he had not washed and so on so she's in Satyavati not seeing not not sort of heeding his word there said uh, no this this really needs to be done now you know we are in dire straits this needs to be done now so anyway um uh he says, okay, well, you are my mother, and it's also dharma that one obey one's mother, the desires of one's mother. Um, his mother is considered to be the first guru, and so on and so forth. There's all kinds of things about that. But anyway, so he goes in and to um, make love to the first um, princess, the first queen, and she closes her eyes out of fright. And he says, well, you know, you will have an incredibly strong son, incredibly intelligent. Um, he will be born blind, right? So this is, this is not acceptable because in this society, this time, one could not be king if one was blind. Um, there's a couple of different reasons for that. Um, one, because the um, you know, daredevil notwithstanding, um, the Kshatriya is like, if you were king, right, it's not like today where um, the executive, the head of state, you know, is behind enemy lines and whatnot and issuing orders and so forth. The king was expected to be at the forefront of the battle, right? And so if one was blind, one could not do that, therefore one could not be king. Um, you know, you do have interesting, um, as a side note, you have interesting um, historical precedent for uh, various military leaders in, you know, overcoming disability in some interesting ways, like Ivar the Boneless, you know, he was a um, Scandinavian um, warlord, right? Who was uh, who, who was uh, paralyzed, and he was carried around on a uh, uh, a plank, like, and he was still able to direct 
battle and so forth. It's like this, despite his legs being quote unquote boneless, right? So anyway, that's just a, a side note. But yeah, they, they were like, how can this blind person, you know, become king for that reason, right? So he said, well, you know, Vyasa, Vyasa, why don't you go to um, this other, other queen? Amba and Abalka were their names. So anyway, he goes into the the other queen and she keeps her eyes open because she was she was warned, right? She keeps her eyes open, but she sees what he looks like and um, all of the blood rushes out of her face for for uh, for fear, out of fear. And because you know these are these are princesses, they they're kind of bougie, right? They're, they, 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 they've never really dealt with any kind of any kind of uh, hardship in their lives, you know, um, very sheltered, right? So here's this this ascetic who's all kinds of just um, he looks uh, unearthly, otherworldly to them, and um, and not like a not like a celestial being, not like you know some kind of angel or something, but just really uh, frightening and so he says um your son will be pale uh, and 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 have ill health right so he won't be blind though right but he'll be he, he'll he'll, have, he'll struggle with himself and he'll be pale so um then they actually Send a mate. Uh, they um, ask one of the women to, to, to do it again, right? <laughs> so, well, it's turning again. So, what, but what she does is she she uh, she puts her maid servant in her place. And you know, again, um, looking back at the biblical narrative, the Genesis Genesis narrative, um, we've seen that when one puts one's maid servant in one's place doesn't always work out um, the way that one intends. And this actually didn't work out so badly. Um, it just kind of pissed off Vyasadev in a sense. It, well, I don't want to say pissed off. It, it annoyed him, right? Because it was dece deception, right? So, but the maidservant was not afraid of him at all. And this is a great commentary. This is a great, um, a great Marxist commentary in a way. Because, you know, here she is of the people. She is not, you know, um, princely. Uh, you know, she's not royalty, right? And she sees Vyasa basically for who he is and um, not frightened. So, I mean, and so the issue from that union is born with incredible intelligence, um, you know, and, and and it's just a great and a great figure. Um, the the children were Dhritarashtra, blind, Pandu, which literally means pale, um, and uh, and Kripa. And so, but Kripa, he is great, but because his mother's a essentially a maidservant, he cannot be king, right? So he 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 does a lot. Um, in the Mahabharat by way of an advisory role and, uh, and so forth, but he cannot be king. And so you can see here now some of the, some of the issues, right? Dhritarashtra is the oldest. So by way of tradition, he should be the king. However, uh, he's blind. So he can't be king. So his younger brother, right? younger brother is, is the is the heir apparent right so you can see that where the where the resentment is there because Deuterostra is certainly qualified to be king in all other respects he's brilliant he's super strong um, you know and in fact when he gets married he, he marries an incredibly noble woman of uh, Gandharvi uh, Gandhari excuse me she ties a, a, a um, scarf around her eyes and says that if, if her husband can't see, she's not going to see, you know, so, um, 
And then Pandu ends up marrying um, Kunti, um, who's actually the aunt of Krishna, um, which that that, fig that figures in prominently. And um, and then um, Madri, um, a younger, uh, prettier wife. Uh, I don't want to say that, but 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 you know. And we saw this also with Dasarath that he had you know the favorite wife and so forth. Well. Um, but in any case, Kunti was definitely the, the wise, um, the wise queen and the name Kunti actually means, uh, uh, wisdom. So in, in some, some languages, uh, uh, which is where we get certain words in the English language that I'm not going to say here, but you can use your imagination. Um, I will say the F word on video, but it will not say that. Okay, now, point being is that um, Pandu and his wives, and so Pandu's ruling the earth nicely. Everything's going well. You know, there's some resentment with his brother, but his brother does love him. Um, so the kingdom's all going very well. They're being advised by Bhishma and, uh, and, and Kripa. And so forth, and, and everything's going very well. Um, any any kind of kings that give them any problems, any kind of any kind of like little kingdoms out there, you know, little city states and whatnot, they give them problems. They just send out Bishma. And Bishma is the greatest warrior in the world. He just conquers them most of the time. They don't even fight because they're like, well, why why resist Bishma? You know, who's going to resist Bishma? You know. So anyway, so one day Pandu is. Um, out hunting because you know kshatriyas are warriors and part of part of the way that they keep up their their combat skills is is by hunting so hunting is a, is a great um sport for them so he's out hunting and so this constantly throughout um indian literature as well as actually Greek literature and, and uh, other ancient literatures, the, the following is, is constantly getting people into trouble. And that is you do not um, interrupt or attack or assault anybody, whether they be a human, um, an animal, a god, whoever they may be, especially in the, in the Indian system, because of course, Everybody are souls. They just happen to be embodied differently. But this, but a, a soul is a soul, right? So we're all kind of equal in that regard. But anyway, so you don't you don't interrupt somebody when they're copulating, right? That's just considered. It's it's not like you know when I was growing up, if you saw two dogs going at it or whatever, it's like turn the hose on them, turn the hose on. No, you don't you don't you don't do that in the in the Vedic system. So. Um, Shantan, uh, not Shantan, um, Pandu, you know, sees these, 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 these deer, you know, making love, you know, whatever. He gets the arrow, phew, you know, um, Dasar, the same thing happens to Dasarath actually in the, in the Ramayana. He gets, he gets cursed too, you know, but this is with Pandu, it's, um, finds out he, he, uh, Finds out he's what, what's happened is he's actually um, uh, just killed a a Brahmin couple, human Brahmin couple that had shape shifted uh, to make love because the the wife didn't want to um, didn't want to make love in human form uh, for fear that they'd be seen, you know, and um, and uh, and so and you know hardcore ascetic Brahmins, they don't even have really homes, you know, they, 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 you know, they might have a little shack sometimes or something like that, but they live outside and, um, and, and, and um, uh, you know, rely on the elements and so on. Right? So the Brahmin is, of course, incensed and says, next time you embrace one of your wives um, out of lust or, or the desire to make love, you're going to drop dead. Okay. So Pandu then decides that he is going to become an ascetic 
Um, he's going to go out in the forest. He's going to renounce his kingdom. He's going to go out in the forest and become a, a monk, which is ultimately, ultimately the end goal for more or less everybody in the, in the upper classes um, in the society. The idea is that, that regardless of who you are, you would spend the last years of your life in, in, in contemplation and in, in prayer. But for Pandu, he's a young man. This has just come upon him by way of this curse. And so his wives also join him out in the, in, in the uh, forest. So you've got kind of a Ramayan situation going on with Pandu and his two wives, Kunti and Madri. So now Pandu has a um, conundrum, right? Um, he doesn't have any children. So it's the same conundrum, right, that, that, that we saw before. And he says, well, what are we going to do about this? I can't embrace you in love and, and sex um, because I'll drop it. Well, Kunti says, well, wait a minute. I wasn't going to tell you this because, well, I didn't know you, you would really understand. But, you know, when I was younger, I was visited upon by a Rishi, by a, by a, a Brahmin, a, like um, Prashramuni, right? You know. And, and um, he wanted to make love to me. And he, um, and he did so, um, but preserved my virginity. And he gave me this, um, this mantra, right? And um, this mantra allows me to call any deity that I want, any 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 um, any uh, deva, any shining one. And remember, in 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 the, I mean, depending on your philosophical understanding, right? depending on which philosophical school you um, adopt, right? in terms of these texts, the idea is that there is a supreme and that there are, you know, other beings who are incredibly powerful, whom to us would be considered invincible, immortal, et cetera, et cetera, by comparison, but not by comparison to the supreme. So it's, it's, it's what's called henotheistic, right? Anyway, so, but these are very, very powerful beings. Um, and, uh, she can call them using this mantra. And she said, I, you know, I tried it. I, I tried out this mantra. This mantra. And actually, uh, she, she, she tried out this mantra. And um, she called the sun god. And the sun god came out and he gave her this, this child and, um, without losing her virginity. Right? And child was born in golden armor um, and so on. She put the child in a basket and on the river and um, she didn't see the child anymore. Well, this child later becomes Karna and he's, he's a very, he's an enemy to Pandu's sons and so on and so forth. I'm not going to necessarily get into all that, but so she said, this mantra works. Um, and so she um, ultimately uses the mantra three times and calls down first uh, Dharma, the, the god of justice, the, the actual embodiment of, of, of Dharma, the god of justice. And uh, that child then becomes Yudhishthir, um, the earthly embodiment of, of Dharma or the ideal king. Um, he's got some issues though, and we'll, we'll talk about that, but, and then, um, um, I'm not, I can't recall the order, but Indra, he calls down Indra, she, she calls down Indra, and the, the result is Arjun, Arjuna, who is the, along with Krishna, the principal figure of the Bhagavad Gita, right? and he's the greatest archer in the world, and so on and so forth, or will be, right? Um, 
and uh, and then uh, calls down Vayu, the the wind god, who's also the father of Hanuman, um, and uh, he creates uh, and, and the child from there is is Bhima, right? Um, so and Bhima is super super strong. He's he's and uh, and and he can eat anything. He, he has a, he's an unquenchable appetite. So, and he becomes a very, very renowned mace fighter. Uh, with it. Um, he's trained by Krishna's brother Balaram in, in mace fighting. But any, in any case, um, so Madre is like, hey, I, I, I want to try this out, you know. And again, Kunti and Madre don't hate each other. They, but there is some rivalry, you know. There, there's just like it was some some competitive rivalry going on there, you know. And um, Madre says, well, um, I want to try it out. So she kind of hedges her bets and calls on the twin god, the twin Ashvins, the, the, the twin gods. There's two gods that are twins. Anyway, so she gets two sons in one go. And that kind of uh, Nakula and Sahadev, right? So that kind of pretty, uh, Kunti's kind of miffed about that, right? You know? She's a little bit miffed about that. And uh, so she refuses to let Madri use the mantra again. And so Pandu, Pandu then has five sons. Meanwhile, and Yudhishthir being the oldest of all, meanwhile, um, Gandhari, the wife of Dhritarashtra, becomes pregnant. And she becomes pregnant and with this massive, massive, um, and this, this, this is actually depicted in the... Um, in 18 days, right? She becomes pregnant with this massive ball, you know, massive ball of flesh. And and, and she gives birth to this and, and, and everybody's just like horrified and whatnot. Well, what they ultimately do is they cut the ball into hundred pieces and put the pieces in, and then one, there's one daughter. So it's like 101, but they put the pieces in them um, in jars and ultimately in these jars the um the embryos mature into 100 sons and one daughter um the oldest of which is Duryodhana right and you have the whole thing in the 18 days which is is is, is very played out really nicely where Dhritarashtra has this vision of this peacock holding the holding the the world in its mouth and defending the world from the wolf. And, De and Deuterostra says, well, Duryodhana is the peacock and so forth. So and clearly, Duryodhana is the wolf and the peacock is Krishna, right? But um, in any case, uh, which Pandu is still in the forest at this point. And the, the, the children actually grow very, very, very rapidly um, to, you know, because they're, they're celestial children, you know, they're not normal human beings. And um, in any case, Pandu is like really digging life out in the forest. Um, and he, because he's got sons, he's, other than not having sex, he's got a rel relatively ide idyllic life out in the forest. So he kind of becomes a little bit complacent because, you know, that's what happens when things are going well. And one day he embraces uh, Madri um, uh, in, in love and, of course, immediately drops dead. And so there's this, and it remains controversial to this day, right? Because people use, um, in, in India, up until very, very recent history and probably still in some places, rural places and so forth, um, some women have been forced to um, enter the funeral pyres of their husbands, um, you know. Uh, but if it's done voluntarily, you know, um, in this sort of legendary context, mythical context, it was understood to be very, again, very noble and very apropos to one's um, station. Um, you know, but when, of course, that's forced on somebody or done for, you know, 
selfish reasons, whatnot. To, in, in other words, if someone's forcing someone to do that, obviously that's horrible. And um, I want to say it's illegal in India at present. I'm 99.9% I'm positive. Um, but um, in any case, Madri agrees to go into the Tandu's uh, funeral pyre um, because even though you know she is the mother of Nicole and Sahadev, um, they actually <laughs> Kunti is the more maternal, and all of the children um, look to Kunti as the as the primary mother. So um, she she joins Pandu. Um, in the next world, if you will. And uh, so ultimately, Kunti and the five sons, they go back to Hastinapur. And the five sons are raised, of course, raised by Kunti, but also by Bhishma. And um, there's all kinds of adventures that ensue with the young Kuruvas, the, the, the Duryodhana and his brothers trying to, trying to kill the Pandavas and so forth as they're your children, you know, you can look at that as kind of like, you know, Superboy, you know, you know, like, like, you know, adolescent Superman and so on and so forth. Because really these all kinds of fantastic things happen. But anyway, um, the one thing I do want to mention because this character factors into the war and also into um, into the 18 days, if you watched it, is that uh, Dronacharya shows up and Dronacharya is understood to be, he's a, he's a Brahmin who actually um, took up arms, and which is rare that a, that a, that a ascetic would actually um, be expert in military um, affairs, but he's understood to be the expert in military affairs next to Bishma. And um, he, uh, he becomes the teacher of the, the Kauravas and the Pandavas. And this incident, that I'm, uh, and I'm, I'm mentioning this incident because it's one of the more, it's one of the more well known in the Mahabharat. But it's also, it's also one that they got wrong in the, uh, in the, in the video, and that is the incident of the of Arjun shooting through the eye of the bird. Well, technically, it was not the king that tells him to do that. It's Dronacharya, and you know, they're still relatively young when that happens, and it's a clay bird and the way that Arjun is able to shoot through that bird is because he is able to zero out everything except for the eye of the bird the, his target and Drona then vows to make him the greatest archer in the world so much so that um, when another potential great archer is found at Ekalavya he says, you know, to be my disciple, you've got to cut off your, cut off your right thumb, uh, thereby preventing him from being a better archer than Arjun. Okay. So, anyway, and all these adventures happen, you know, for, for years and years and years. Um, ultimately, in, in the Pandu, in, in every time, the Pandus, um, every time the Kuravas have a plot to take down the Pandavas. Um, the Pandavas take that, you know, um, unfair position and they make it into something absolutely beautiful and glorious and then the Kauravas get jealous and they come up with another plot and so on and so forth. It's, it's a whole lot to go through, but basically, uh, one thing I will mention is that Arjuna actually went... When, when they're they're in disguise at one point because again like Rama they are exiled at one point and, and everything and uh, they're in exile and Arjuna wins the beautiful Draupadi in um, during her Svayambara and he's going back to his mother and his and his brothers and he he is telling his mother, you know, you know, um, I just I, I won something, you know, hey, you know, let me, let me, I can't wait to explain this to you. And she said, whatever you've won, you must share equally among your brothers, right? 
So long story short is Dropity ends up with five husbands. Um, now the husbands also have other wives. All, 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 as far as I know, all five of the husbands end up having other wives, but they all are also married to Dropity. And this is a major factor because what happens next is that uh, Shakuni, who's the uncle, who's, who's the brother of um, Indari, the uncle of the Kuravas, right? He says, well, here, I've got an idea to take down Yudhisthira. Everybody knows, and this, this is in the 18 days, you know, everybody knows Yudhisthira loves gambling, but he's really, he really sucks at it, right? So, and again, with this Kshatriya code, Yudhisthira can't refuse him. It goes against society to do that, you know. So, in any case, um, He ends up losing everything, including he 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 bets himself and loses. Then after he bets himself, he bets. Well, I don't have anything except for Dropity, right? So he bets Dropity. Well, Dropity and the Kuravas are just really now you know uncouth. They don't follow any kind of convention of any sort, right? And uh, and and there's a well go go get Dropity. You know, bring her to us, right? Bring, bring her here. So you get the one of the the Kuravas goes um, and gets Draupadi, and she is actually um, secluded because she's on her she's menstruating, right? And, that, and that's considered a very sacred time, time of contemplation, etc., etc., etc. And it's just, you don't go into a woman's um, menstrual area and uh, disturb her, right? But no, they did. They did. And, and brought her in, in there. And she said, Yudhisthira had no right to bet her because he had already lost himself before betting her. And so, um, but they, they, they grab her at the end of her sari. And a sari is one continuous piece of cloth that's just wrapped and pinned in various different ways. Um, well, they grab the end of her sari to try to undress her in public and humiliate her and, and everything, and to make her subservient. And Draupadi, and interestingly, Draupadi is understood to be the beauty standard here is certainly not the British beauty standard. And you'll see a lot of the depictions in the um, of later depictions of the Mahabharata, even in um, even in you know contemporary artworks around the Mahabharata and so forth. You'll see. Um, a lot of the characters with pale skin and so we're obviously pound dude, but you'll see characters depicted as as Caucasian-esque, right? Um, well, this was not the case. I mean, Dropity was black, okay? Dropity was very dark skinned and she was considered to be the most beautiful woman in the world. So it's interesting to note the, the beauty standard. Also, Krishna was considered to be the most attractive man in the world and Krishna, um, well, man, in quotation marks, because he, um, according to this text, is 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 the divine. So, but but Krishna is black. I mean, one of the meanings of the word Krishna is black, right? So Krishna is black, blue black. Um, and so, um, in anyway, that's just a note on beauty standard. But but um, anyway, they're trying to pull her sari off, and what Draupadi does is she calls out to Krishna. And her sorry just becomes limitless, and they cannot undress her. Yeah. And um, there's this big a bunch of stuff that happens after that point. But really, the the harassment of Draupadi is where Krishna draws the line, and and that's that's where the the war has to take place at that point. They they crossed. Um, a line that is, you know, uncrossable, basically. And um, so then you have this war that's that's going to take place. And Krishna agrees to be Arjuna's charioteer. Duryodhana gets Krishna's army, which is just like special forces, like, like the best trained army in the world. But Arjuna gets Krishna, not in, as a combatant, because he, 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 he vows not to fight, but, um, but as an advisor and as a chariot driver, right? So then, you know, you have the 
before the battle, before the first beginning of the battle, Arjun is in great peril because he's like, I've, I've got to, because uh, Bhishma is loyal to the throne, even though, even if he thinks that Dhritarashtra and Duryodhana are completely out of, out of line, he is loyal to his father's dynasty. That's, that's, and, and Drona as well. Okay, so Bhishma and Drona are on the other side. Um, many other, you know, great figures and they're basically people that Arjuna has known his entire life are on the other side. How's he going to fight? You know, how's he going to fight him? How's he going to fight his grandfather? He says, I can't do it. So he draw, he says, um, he says, um, um, Govinda, I shall not fight. Govinda is one of Krishna's names, meaning um, um, lover of cows, the uh, cow, cow herd boy. But anyway, he, he drops his bow and, um, and the symbol, again, the bow imagery, you know, dropping the bow, meaning, you know, he, he lays down his power, you know, particularly his masculine agency, he lays it down. Krishna says, Krishna first laughs at him. And then he says, um, you know, uh, and then Arjuna says, the key, the key verse in the entire Gita, the catalyst for the rest of it is uh, chapter two, verse seven, where Arjuna says that he doesn't know what to do. And he asks Krishna to instruct him. And that's when the nature of the relationship deepens, uh, opens up to a different dimension because they had been best friends for years and years and years. And there's all kinds of um, um, depictions of that throughout the Mahabharata, you know. But uh, Krishna then becomes teacher. Um, and um, in essence, what he tells Arjun is that if he's not fighting here in this righteous cause to restore um, Dharma, right, in defense of Dharma, then he's just going to fight somewhere else. Because his nature as a Kshatriya is the nature of engagement in that kind of activity, right? And furthermore, if he doesn't fight here, his reputation's ruined. Um, you know, all these things are important for noble people, right? And um, he says, incidentally, you know, nobody, you're not really killing anybody. Because these people are not the body. You know, he says, there's never been a time where I did not exist, nor these kings. Right? So he's basically saying, you know, the soul is eternal. So when you kill the body, you know, what does that really mean? Ultimately, what does that really mean? And that's not to say that. Krishna was advocating, you know, mass genocide or anything like that, or saying that life is futile. In fact, but in the context of this battle to restore order, to restore um, balance in the force, if you will, you know, this is, this is a significant moment. And Arjuna, his dharma, where dharma had been leading, unfolding for him, is right here on this battlefield. And to deny that is to deny who he is. And so ultimately they get into this discussion, you know, about what are the most efficient and best ways to realize one's purpose in life. And uh, they go through in Krishna breaks down all the different yoga systems and so on and, and everything and um, throughout the conversation Krishna ultimately reveals his identity as the divine and it, it, it culminates in his revealing the universal form um, this universal form um, you see there's there's all kinds of famous depictions of it, you'll see Krishna's face and then, you know, um, cascading outward faces of all the different um, shining ones and so forth, both uh, beautiful and terrible, and you'll see all the universes and everything. And um, it's so 
massive, right? That um, Arjuna just can't can't comprehend it. And he says, you know, please, Krishna, just may I, you know, come back to your two armed form, your, you know, that I'm that I'm used to, you know. So, and and then at that point, Arjuna says, I'm sorry, you know, I we 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 laid out under the stars together, we joked together, we ate together, and all this stuff. All this time, this is who you are. You know, and ultimately, Krishna's conclusion is abandon all varieties of dharma. I mean, sometimes it's translated as religion, but more accurate would be abandon all dharmas and surrender uh, unto me. Right? Meaning that there are these dharmas of one's station, you know, where one is in life and so on and so forth. But the ultimate dharma of every living being is to surrender to the divine and to awaken that eternal relationship with the divine person. Um, that is the, the personalist message of the Bhagavad Gita, right? Um, the idea if if one if one accepts that um, the supreme is a person, um, then 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 that is the message. If one accepts that the entire Bhagavad Gita is metaphorical for an internal struggle, we have the same. And this is laid out in the Gita as well. We have the same image as from the Katha Upanishad where you have the um, charioteer, i.e. Um, uh, Krishna, and you have the, um, the rider Arjun, and you have the horses, right? So you have the soul, the mind, the, 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 the senses, and the horses, and it's all about controlling that and, and so on and so forth. And it's all in, in the battlefield is, is, is the body, right? The battle. So, and that's, that, that, that's kind of the Gandhian point of view um, which is useful, right? But the viewpoint that's really caught on with a lot of people and it's really become extremely meaningful to a lot of people in the, in, in, in the past 70 years, 70, 80 years, went on, is, is this um, devotional aspect uh, uh, to to Krishna or to the divine person, whether you know you want to call um, that divine person Yahweh or or whatever, you know that's that's a personal that's a personal matter. But but um, and you can see a lot of parallel ultimately with um, with Christianity in this, as we'll see in the um, as we'll see when we look at the Gospels, um, and and ultimately we're not going to cover, say for example, the letters of Paul. But even even with the letters of Paul, and certainly certainly with um, some of the uh, Christian mystics, um, like for example Julian of Norwich, um, you know. Uh, but that is in us. That's kind of the the rough cut of what you need to understand what leads up to the Mahabharata War, in which the in the central point of the is the. Bhagavad Gita, which is also called the Gita Upanishad, it's it's held on the same level as as the Upanishads, um, and it is the most universally revered text in uh, Sanatana Dharma, and um, of course, folks around the world. I mean, you watch the video, so so where are that? Um, but this video has already gone on for quite a long time. I will point to the Krishna comic book. Uh, it really gives a, a, a nice kind of glimpse into the first couple of chapters of the uh, 10th canto of the Bhagavad Purana. Um, and it really kind of gives this um, mythical context, right? For who, who Krishna is. I mean, you know, within the context of these narratives. 
And um, interestingly, you know, there's a lot of parallels with the, with the story of Christ there as well. But, um, but anyway, in, like I said, in class, we're going to, depending on when you watch this, it would have been after class, et cetera, et cetera. But we're going to look at some specific quotations of Bhagavad Gita, not, and I'm not going to, you know, burden you with various um, interpretations. I'm going to, I'm going to let you um, look at those and, and really kind of, kind of think about what they mean, what they don't mean, um, whether they mean anything to you, right? And um, that'll also give you a jump on your reflection for this for this week too, because you can use the material from the exercise ultimately um, in your in your um, not well in your in your um, reading journal. You can kind of parlay those together, right? So um, anyway, thanks for listening.